welcome to another episode of Data of Our Future. Usually when we talk about data, a lot of questions come up with people who want to go into the field asking about how to start a career in data. However, once people get into the field, more questions coming up as how do I develop my data career? And this can evolve in many different ways. If you are someone who is very into technical vertical development, you might develop your machine learning AI analytics skills further. Or if you're someone who is more interested in the management side, you might transition from an individual contributor to a team lead. There are also people who are diversifying their portfolio. They are trying to write blog, giving lectures, and writing books. With many cool options on the table, we want to shed light on how this process is working in real life. That's why today we have Alexi here on the show. Alexi, just a quick introduction. He is the principal data scientist at the company OLX, which is an online marketplace for local good exchange. Meanwhile, he also runs the data community, datatalks.club, which is a super cool platform to learn more about data knowledge and get to know more data professionals. Alexi also wrote a few books on machine learning AI, one of which is called the Book Camp. It's a book for software engineers to get into machine learning. So with many things he has been touching upon, I feel he will be a very interesting example to show people what are the possibilities existing there to further develop the data professional career. So welcome to the show, Alexi. Thanks. So thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for uh, such a great introduction. So I'm curious, when I see your title is a principal data scientist, how is it different from a data scientist? What's the, what's the role about? So uh, in general, in, uh, okay, if I want to describe what a principal data scientist is, in a few words, principal data scientist is an internal consultant. So Oilix is quite a large company. We have many, many different uh, use cases for machine learning. We have more than uh, 40 different use cases. Um, like ranging from uh, um, moderation use cases when we want to prevent, uh, uh, let's say if somebody is trying to sell a gun, we don't want this to happen, or from fraud, or from uh, two recommendations and search, and uh, like there, there, are, there are a lot of different use cases. And my role is to help others. So um, let's say if there is a new project starting, um, I would uh, try to get involved from the very beginning and try to understand if it's feasible to do this project, like do we really need machine learning for this project or not? Um, what kind of data is there? Has somebody in the company already worked on this project or not? Um, often uh, it happens that somebody already worked on this and for some reasons project uh, got uh, yeah, maybe not successful or it was successful, but just people don't know about this. Um, so I need to stay on top of everything and uh, know what's going on and uh, then uh, yeah basically help others and one big uh, direction here uh, as, as principal i'm uh, driving engineering topics mm -hmm. so like uh, once we have a model how do we go about deploying this what are the things we need to think about uh, there are many many different ways of deploying models what is the right one how to make it easier for data scientists to select the right one do they have the right tools for that um, um, and things like this. This is uh, one of the things I'm uh, also taking care of. Wow, that's super cool for a company to have a position for people to do that. Now I understand as many people or company are developing their technology stacks, data tools, it's very common people just get lost. And as you said, like, very often the things you're developing, other people already developed, used it, but you just couldn't find it easily. And it seems that you're taking on the more of the consultancy role for the internal company. That's very cool. Did you start it with the company as a principal data scientist? No. So I started as a senior data scientist and uh, first I worked on uh, like just uh, uh, in a team. So I worked on multiple projects. So for example, one of the projects was uh, duplicate detection. So let's say somebody is trying to sell a phone mm -hmm. and they are so desperate that they post the same phone multiple times on the platform. Mm -hmm. And then for the buyers, for those who want to buy a phone, this is bad user experience, right? So they see the same phone, uh, the same phone or, or 
over all over the, the website, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some sometimes cases when these duplicates are actually fraud. So let's say a fraudster mm -hmm. comes to uh, our website and they copy uh, a good listing from somebody who is trying to sell, let's say a phone or I don't know something else like usually electronics, and then they pretend it's theirs. So like they're good people. Wow. And uh, yeah, and then uh, usually they put a price that is cheaper, and um, they try to trick people into giving them some advance. And usual a line there is, "Hey, there are three people in front of you, uh, but if you really want to show that you're serious, give me like I don't know, fifty dollars deposit, uh, things like this." Okay. So usually the the angle there is it's a duplicate of some other item, mm -hmm. and this is what I was working on. Uh, like the problem I was solving. Then I worked on multiple such problems and then I eventually got promoted to a lead data scientist. Uh, and the lead data scientist is like a principal, but maybe his scope is not uh, like it's a bit uh, uh, like for a principal, maybe the scope is wider. Um, yeah, I worked as a lead uh, for some time, like for a year, and now I'm a principal. Doing pretty much the same work, maybe uh, also taking care more of standardization. Um, like let's say we have six, seven different teams that use mm -hmm. uh, machine learning. Like how do we make sure that uh, they all follow the same procedures, the same processes, they use uh, similar tools. So if somebody wants to move from one team to another, they, uh, uh, you know, it's easy for them. So this is the, the things I'm doing now. But before that, two, three years ago, I was working just on usual projects. And I guess this is uh, to answer your Initial question, what is the difference between a data scientist and a principal data scientist? This is the main difference. So a data scientist is usually assigned to one particular project to a particular team, while a principal is not assigned to a particular team. And there are, there are many, many projects that they are working on at the same time. Mm -hmm. It definitely comes from your experience working on individual projects and you have the pain, you know, like, okay, this this schema doesn't work for the other machine learning tool and how do I monitor and standardize everything? Definitely grow out of it. So what is the stack you've been choosing for a team to use for standardization? Well, it's not like I'm choosing the stack. It's mm -hmm. uh, we need to think what teams already use and how to make this transition less painful for them. If uh, let's say a team needs to uh, stop using a tool and start using a new tool. And uh, the way to make it, one way to make it smooth is to say, it's not like you stop everything and you migrate and you start using a new tool, but mm -hmm. for new projects, you try to use a new tool. It's not like you have to, but let's try and then explain benefits. So it's not like I'm uh, a boss and telling people you have to do this. I need to do convincing. Yeah, totally. So I, I need think... to convince. Uh -huh. That's the That's mentality the... of the principal or the lead is, you're not giving orders, you're trying to convey them, be at servant, this will be good. And uh, you always start with a new project, yeah, totally. So what about your transition before that, before you get into a senior position? Like when did you switch from a software engineer to a data scientist? And then how did you accumulate your knowledge to be senior, senior enough? I think for that, a uh, few things helped. So apart from having, uh, so I had a usual job. And then in addition to the my day-to-day -day job, I was trying to actively take part in different competitions, um, like machine learning competitions like Kaggle. And there are many other platforms for that. I think that really helped to widen um, the, my horizon, like to know what are the possible problems that machine learning can solve. And um, I don't know, in uh, maybe it took part in like 20, 30 competitions. I'm not taking part in competitions anymore because they just take too much time. Um, but it was fun. So I, I think I learned really a lot. And uh, yeah, that, that helped. And then at work, um, yeah, I was just trying to work on what makes sense and then um, uh, but by that, I mean, uh, like, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Try to answer that question. Like, is it really helpful or is it just because somebody read a cool article and want to implement this? Uh, what is the reason we're working on this project? Sure. Uh, I, I do uh, agree. I think that comes a lot with when you transition from a data scientist to a lead mindset. 
this is very key, you know, like you're not really solving a problem for the intellectual challenge for the problem itself to use a cool algorithm. It's more about coming from the business side, what really is needed and makes sense. And just going back a little bit, when you talk about the cable competition, of course, everyone going to learning about data, data science is a platform everyone is looking into. But as you mentioned, it's very time consuming to really participate. Also, if you don't have experience, it's very hard to stand out among all the competitions. If I recall correctly, you actually teach people how to win Kegel competitions. Are there <laughs> some really. tips, tips you would like to share? Well, uh, no, I'm not really teaching because I haven't won a competition on Kaggle. So on Kaggle, it's very tough to win a competition. Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, I was lucky to end up in uh, top 10, like uh, our team was fifth in one of the competitions, but that was the highest I got, so, and then the prize was uh, top three. So like I cannot really teach people how to win competitions because they haven't, but uh, maybe if you want to do well in competitions, yeah, maybe I can speak um, about that, uh, because I, I think I did uh, quite well there. Um, yeah, it's just about putting time there. So there is no the easy time. win. So just putting time, then trying different things, um, checking the forums. Uh, there is a lot of information uh, being shared there. And then just uh, also try not, uh, like when I was taking part in these competitions, the code I had was a complete mess. I had like, uh, for a competition, I had like 30, 40 different notebooks. And this is just insane. It's mind blowing to remember, okay, which submission uh, was generated by which notebook? Um, like, uh, the, what helps is somehow try to have a system there. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, maybe use some tracking tool, experiment tracking tool like uh, MLflow um, to understand what uh, which code really produced the, this result. And yeah, I would suggest that because for me, that was the main problem when I was taking part. Mm -hmm. um, like more like organizational, like how do I um, uh, organize my code? Um, yeah, so that and to, yeah, just be ready to put uh, time. Yeah, th th there is no magic deal. Do you have teammates to collaborate with? Yeah, so how the, the way you find them. Yeah, the way it usually happens is uh, you go on, let's take Kaggle as an example. You go to Kaggle, you start taking part in competition, and then you uh, do reasonably well, let's say you end up in uh, top 100 or top 200. Um, and then we see what are the people around you with a similar score. And then you just uh, say, hey, looks like we're quite close to each other, but mm -hmm. still there is a long way up and let's merge. And then um, some of them will say, no, sorry, like I'm <laughs> more like I'm solo. Mm -hmm. uh, but some would say yes. and. Uh, often it happens that people actually start reaching out to you themselves so i um for example for a competition where we ended up like in top 20. Mm -hmm. um yeah it was uh, i don't remember how it actually happened i think the the my teammate actually reached out to me saying hey do you want to uh, to do it together mm -hmm. and then we did it together and uh, instead of being like a uh, top 100 we ended up in top 20. So yeah, yeah, just uh, just reach out to people. But the, the important thing here is start. So you already need to have a good position there. If mm -hmm. you don't have a good position, and then you say, hey, do you want to team up with? Uh, like if somebody reaches out to me and say, do you want to team up with me? No, I don't. <laughs> like why would I? <laughs> because you just appeared. I don't know if uh, like uh, if you are good or not. Mm -hmm. um, so like, the best way is already start and then show your results yeah right when you're already on the leaderboard and then you can reach out to people and say hey we are close let's uh, let's team yeah team up yeah as you mentioned like no matter the finding a team for completing a objective or even the community the forum offered by keiko or many other yeah, platforms exactly. there is a the idea about learning involves a lot about community and learning from peers or people who have more experience so I want to transition the lens to your data talk club. I stumbled upon it with one talk and I find the format outlet is very interesting and you have very frequent talks and it's all very relevant topic. I'm very curious what inspired you to start the club in the first place. Yeah, so communities, 
communities were a big part of my career even before i started working like it, it was a being a part of a community was a big part of my um, like when i was at school for example uh, when i got my first computer i was uh, learning how to program and then i didn't have books and then uh, on top of that not only i didn't have books i also couldn't uh, read documentation in english and uh, it was mostly like I, my native language is russian so there was not much uh, in russian about that specific language it was borland delphi um, so my mother uh, had access to the internet uh, at her work so i would sometimes go uh, there and um, so i found a forum there and on the internet and then i would just come there and ask questions and uh, surprisingly people would just respond like it was something simple and then uh, like mm -hmm. people would just respond and then eventually like i was uh, um, going there like collecting my questions uh, writing them down and then going to my mom uh, and then asking them on the internet and eventually somebody asked a question on the forum and i was able to answer that that was like wow i could uh, help some professional person mm -hmm. uh, like um, me being at school, um, like helping somebody who's already working as a developer. And that, uh, like this way, I actually learned how to program. Then uh, when I already, after my bachelor, when I started my first job as a Java developer, so the, the way, uh, like the first thing I did, I was reg I registered at a Java forums, like at a forum about Java. And then I started answering questions there. And then after half a year, people thought that I am uh, like I'm an expert. I know something about Java. They <laughs> didn't know that I'm a junior who just started uh, uh, my career, right? Mm -hmm. So people would uh, ask me questions, right? So they would write me directly asking, hey, how, how do I do that? And then eventually this uh, even got me uh, like a team lead position in, in an open source project. Um, like I. I was a junior, I just graduated half a year ago. And then somebody mm -hmm. writes me saying, hey, do you want to lead a, like an, a part of this open source project? And I thought, yes, I want, <laughs> you know, why not? So like communities mm -hmm. um, are a big part of my career in general. And then the same, like when I, uh, a couple of years after that, I thought, okay, like I don't want to do Java anymore. I want to do now data science. So what I did, I registered in, uh, um, like there is a stack exchange, which is like a mm -hmm. network of uh, Q&A questions. Like there is a, a site called uh, cross validated, and there is a site called data science. Um, so the, the, these are basically like Stack Overflow like websites, but for different topics. And then what I would do there while I was doing my masters is every day I would log in and check what are the questions there, and I would try to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. and, it really helped me like uh, with interviews afterwards because people would ask me these questions uh, on the interviews so uh, i'm not sure if i'm actually answering your question about how i started i think i started way way uh, mm -hmm. back it's all but... about this concept of community <laughs> which i love yes. the example you're giving is truly inspiring no from the aspect of how much you can learn from it but also from the aspect how it really push you into the girls trajectory of your career and i uh, like when you mentioned like all of a sudden you're engaging in the forum forum you jump from a junior to a lead position people acknowledge your seniority because of your presence and mm -hmm. i think that's something community really brings us as well through mm -hmm. the interaction mm -hmm. so yeah. the original question was what inspired you to build the community which i think you're on a really good trajectory of explaining it now we see yeah. the foundation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically, uh, like communities was uh, like it uh, was a big part of my life. And then at some point, uh, so I was um, helping people in LinkedIn. So a year ago, um, I uh, I was posting on LinkedIn very frequently, like I don't know every day. Uh, and then people would write me in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, these direct messages asking things like, "Hey, what do you think about that?" Like I, I don't know, I want to speech from the uh, data engineering to data science, can I do this? So most of these questions were quite similar, right? And uh, I had quite a lot of them. And mm -hmm. I thought, hmm, maybe there is a way to answer these questions, uh, not in one one way, but uh, scale it somehow. So maybe mm -hmm. 
have a place where I can answer once and then people would see this and then some of them maybe will uh, like that somebody who I helped who also will do this afterwards right and then um, um, yeah and then one day I woke up and thought okay let's buy a domain data logs club <laughs> and then i registered yeah then uh, i registered it in slack so then i set up uh, a landing page in mailchimp and yeah so it took like i don't know half an hour maybe less um, <laughs> and it just happened and i put a link to um, my github profile i think and um, my linkedin profile and then people started to register like they, they would find these uh -huh. links somewhere on the internet uh, just randomly stumble upon them and register and then uh, this is when i realized that uh, you know it's uh, getting somewhere like people really like that yeah how many uh, people are in data talk club now oh no right now it's like six thousand i think 6, 000, yeah. yeah and who is running the whole club how many people you have on your team uh well, I guess that would be just me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, like it's a community, so I see that uh, sometimes it self-organizes, so I don't have to like moderate it. Mm -hmm. So there are people who help me with that. And also uh, we are running a course right now, uh, like for about machine learning. And uh, also we have like a team with teaching assistants and then people who are students, like, uh, I don't know, not students, but who are taking the course. So they mm -hmm. also help others so i like that it uh, kind of self-organizes yeah. but uh, when it comes to actually like making announcements or you know writing somebody when somebody comes and starts spamming people like uh, blocking yeah. them uh, and then uh, or asking them hey this is not the right place please uh, move this um, message to some other other place so that's usually me the admin work <laughs> yeah exactly but it's impressive. It seems that your style is to, if I have an idea, I execute. I just do it, do it, do it. And then the organic growth and the, the community just also grows on the side. It appears so, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's right that uh, the, the growth is proportional to the amount of effort I put. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and for that, like, let's say I need to find speakers uh, for the events. Uh, I need to make all these announcements. Uh, uh, and it doesn't seem to, like, if I stop doing this, I don't think community will keep growing. So <laughs> I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. like, I still need to do this. Well, there are some efforts that are very important. Yeah. But among all the things you've been doing, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from the Data Talk Club? Well, probably uh, the biggest one is, it seems like people really care about communities, like they uh, like communities many people come mm -hmm. to data talks club from google so they look up uh, like data data communities uh, mm -hmm. they search this on google yeah. and they come and they register so this is something that people care about i think that's one of the most interesting things so it's not like i have to go to linkedin you know, like every week and say hey there's this new event from our amazing community and then advertise it on the events and i think this is the main driver like mm -hmm. for growth of the community events and uh, things like this but also it happens organically because people want to find a community they yeah. go go to google and then find it uh and that's that's really great um yeah i guess that's maybe the main biggest takeaway and also it's uh, another one maybe it's more difficult than it, than it seems like yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, running a community is uh, such a time-consuming thing. Like I'm trying to automate everything, uh, of course. So let's say compared to um, nine months ago, I'm now uh, I can do things a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of different scripts that help me to do some things, like for publishing, uh, for announcing events. So I have different integrations, like uh, when I create an event in uh, Eventbrite, the platform we use it automatically, like once I press the publish button, uh, it automatically sends, uh, creates a post on Twitter, creates a post on LinkedIn, creates a post in uh, Slack, uh, these kind of things. But yeah, it took some time to figure this out and um, still like uh, it's quite a lot of work actually. So I didn't know about that. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, as it's growing, there are just endless things that you can improve upon as well. And on the other side, we can talk about other than hosting the club, you also are book author. What was the initial motivation and the, what is your gain from writing a book and publishing a book? Mm. So that's an interesting question. So I can say that uh, the gain is not monetary. So uh, writing books uh, <laughs> doesn't make you it doesn't make you <laughs> richer. <laughs> so that's one thing uh, for sure. Um, so the way it happened to me, so I was uh, when I was studying, I think because of my activity in all these public forums, I got noticed by a publisher, and then they wrote me, "Hey, do you want to review books for us? Like be a technical reviewer." I thought, okay, why not? Because I'm getting a book for free. Like for every book I review, I'm getting it for free. And then I also can, uh, like maybe for some topics, uh, maybe there is something new, right? So I get to to learn things. So for me, and I was a student, uh, to me, it seemed like a great deal. Um, so I, I agreed. And then I reviewed like 10 or 15 books um, over, I think it was a couple of years. Uh, and then uh, they wrote me, hey, you're doing such a great job of reviewing books. How about writing a book? Writing class? a book? Yeah, and I thought, hmm, why not? And uh, this is how the first book, uh, my book appeared. It was about Java for machine learning. Uh, maybe another uh, takeaway is don't write books about Java and machine learning. because <laughs> 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 Java is not the, the most exciting language when it comes to machine learning. Anyways, so I thought because I have this background as a Java developer, and then I now know machine learning, how about writing a book about that? This is how my first book appeared. And uh, then I uh, um, was taking part in a different book and as a co-author. So there was like four or five of us. So it was uh, um, like everybody would get just like know, two, two chapters. And uh, yeah, and this book that, uh, like, it was about, like, the, the style there was project based. So every um, every chapter was a project, like a standalone project. Okay. And people from mining, the, this is the publisher that uh, where I'm publishing my current book. Um, so they saw this and they really like this approach, like, of project based. And then they reach out saying, hey, we saw this book. It's really great. Do you want to write another one for us? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, Mm, maybe I don't because it's such a, it takes so much time to write a book. But somehow I, I thought of declining, um, but then I agreed. I don't know if I should have uh, it's because it's been like two and a half years, <laughs> but it's almost, it's almost there. It's almost uh -huh. published. So this is, I'm now talking about this machine learning book come. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is how it happened. Um, I think it was like maybe uh, natural. Like mm -hmm. all the this transition, so it's not like uh, I woke up and uh, wrote a book for mining immediately. Mm -hmm. Just like step by step uh, journey. It's all a process, mm -hmm. but do you feel by forcing yourself to organize your thoughts, your knowledge, to put in a book and then pass on the knowledge to other people, you learned certain skills? For example, the most obvious one is you learn yourself about what you're writing about, and then the mm -hmm. communication. What is the biggest gain from there? Yeah, so I learned a lot for, from the last book with mining. I learned a lot because they have a very structured process of reviews and uh, they follow the same kind of structure for all their books. And uh, so this structure is really well thought through. So like mining have been doing technical books for, for a lot of time. So they know how they should organize books so it's easy for people for technical audience to consume and by learning about this format and getting constant feedback from the editors saying hey like are you sure this is the best way like hey are you sure this is uh, we actually need to cover this and uh, when when i produced like a chapter that is like i don't know 60 70 pages long they would uh, ask me hey, well, it's too long like maybe you should uh, remove something and then for me well this process uh, what should I remove? What is the most important thing? What is not needed? Uh, by doing that, I learned a lot, uh, and especially writing, because um, like I really needed to focus on writing, and I got a lot of good feedback. And then, uh, even though it took two and a half years, as I said, 
I think I really improved my writing skills. So for example, now um, I also uh, coach, uh, I don't know if I can say coach, but I help my colleagues now um, with blog posts, for example. Uh -huh. Cool. So that was useful. I definitely acknowledge how important it is to write well, you know, I, especially coming from the technical background, we all know the bridge between data tech, technology and the business is very hard for them to understand each other and build mutual understanding. So what, part of the things I've been pushing my team to do as I don't have too much experience publishing and writing is ask everyone to take a technical writing course. And I feel you become this great asset of your team and you have this great skill for yourself is very key transitioning from a data scientist to a more a leading and the management position. Yeah, maybe one tip like um, what I learned from mining and in general from writing is uh, try to avoid long, long sentences. So if you have a sentence that is um, two lines long, that is a bad sentence. Like you have to really make it short and then try to not use smart words. Like when mm -hmm. I was learning English, I would, um, I thought, okay, like I now want to learn this uh, smart word, let's use it. And uh, the thing is with technical books, most of the people who read these books, they are not native, uh, like for them, English is a uh, second language, right? So you don't want to be smart because people will not understand you, right? So try to be, use as simple vocabulary as possible. And then for long sentences, try to, uh, to break them um, like into multiple ones. That's probably the, like, it sounds easy. It's not actually. Like how do you take a long sentence and break it? Mm -hmm, totally. Then, yeah, also read it uh, out loud. It sounds silly, but it actually helps. Like you don't have to shout, but uh, uh, yeah, maybe like uh, also like try to actually say it out loud, not just in your head. Uh -huh. but it, it helps. Like because then you see that some things just don't sound right. Yeah. And then you won't be able to see this when you just read uh, in your head. Cool. So, so far we've been touching upon your developing your seniority, your career with definitely putting more effort into whatever you're doing by taking more projects and learning. On the other side, you're focusing on building this community of learning environment. And also you are producing writing to keep yourself moving forward and developing your communication skills. What about now? What are the things you're focusing on learning? What are some challenges you think you need to develop more knowledge to overcome? Yeah, so right now I'm um, learning really like a bunch of different things. So from, uh, they are not related to data science at all, like marketing, copywriting, uh, um, like how to build up a landing page, like some JavaScript, CSS. Uh, like even I, I have a course that I haven't started about UX design. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do now. And it really helps me because uh, like at work, I don't you know, always need the skills. Um, I do need them for, let's say, for my uh, pet project, uh, air quotes, uh, this data talks club, um, like how do I actually market it, uh, and things like this. Um, yeah, so I did a course. Uh, was a year ago about uh, doing presentations. Uh, that's something I, I still I don't think I'm that good at doing presentations. So, uh, like how to make a presentation really interesting for people. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like you just have a slide with uh, text and you read out loud. Uh, you need to be better than that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it requires a lot of practice uh, and rehearsal. And uh, usually, what I do before giving a talk is uh, I don't rehearse. And I really have to, like, if I want to improve that, I, that's, uh, um, yeah, so this, um, when it comes to data science and, like, in general, uh, data stuff, mm -hmm. so I'm uh, trying to, like, staying on top of things is really impossible now when it comes to data. Um, one thing I'm trying to still not stay on top, but at least catch up and not to be too much behind is, uh, like, all this uh, ML engineering, like, yeah. what is called now L ML Ops. Uh, but like basically yeah, like putting things into production and all that. So I'm trying to just to stay, uh, at least not to fall too much behind. And right now I'm not doing many things um, uh, hands-on. So now I 
um, uh, principle. I also have a team now. So even though I'm supposed to be like an individual contributor, yet I have a team. It's the, the team is small, so only two people. Um, compared to managers, they have like a team of seven or six, seven people. So um, yes, I don't do much hands-on um, work and it's pretty difficult to keep up with engineering if you don't do hands-on stuff. So that's a challenge for me. So how do I do this? Then I'm trying to build small projects and then I don't always have time for these projects. That's, uh, that's another challenge. So how do I find, find time? Like I have work, I have pet projects and I have also uh, um, like a family, like um, yeah. uh, a five years old son, and I also need to sleep. Like, how do I manage to uh, squeeze that in twenty four hours? So that's another problem. Yeah. So I, I, there, there is no course about that. I think I the courses so. yeah. Yeah, they lie. They don't. Uh, they don't actually tell how to do this. Yeah. Well, I guess lack of time is shared across board, but it seems that you have many interesting projects to split your. Uh, attention span and fill your day up, which is very cool. And coming back, as I understand, you're trying to develop a lot of soft skills for yourself and uh, kind of goes beyond your current position specific. And also in terms of data engineering, as you said, in the field of data is still evolving quite fast. And that's why I think the beauty of community is so cool because people show up and they are eager to share about the latest news and the best tools, you know. You might spend one year or two years learning about one tool, but another day comes a, a tool you can learn one month and uh, do it much better. So definitely worth the time to spend on learning and hearing the news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I think that's a very good sum up. So among the many projects, which is the one you are most proud of? Well, I guess that well, it's hard to, to select. So I like the, the book. I like the community. Um, I think there is also like a GitHub repo with interview questions that uh, got some attention also. Like if somebody is uh, preparing for a data science interview, uh, go check it out. Uh, so it's in my GitHub. Um, one project we didn't talk about, uh, uh, it was about like when I was writing a book, there is a chapter about deep learning. Mm -hmm. And for that, so it's a project uh, about image classification. And there I had a problem. How do I select a data set for this, uh, uh, for this project? Like, mm -hmm. how do I find uh, a data set that is not boring, that is not like uh, cats or dogs, like the, the usual one, or mm -hmm. not meniest with uh, these numbers? Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, this is uh, like, of course, it's possible to go to, uh, I don't know, Amazon and scrape images from there. Mm -hmm. but you cannot put this in a book like you cannot write a book about this uh, data set like you cannot uh, print this image like as an example mm -hmm. right so like, the moment you do this uh, like uh, it can have some consequences for me that was a challenge and um, um, the idea I had is what about crowdsourcing like what about creating the data set specifically like open data set that I could use and others can use as well and uh, the idea for me, it was actually my wife who suggested that was to uh, get the data set with clothes, like images of uh, t-shirts, dresses, uh, um, like uh, all these usual clothes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that it's a good idea because everyone has uh, this in their home, like everyone can take a picture. And this is a relatively easy data set to, um, to collect because everybody has that. And yeah, so I just uh, wrote a small post saying, hey, I want to collect a data set of free images uh, that is open that you can use for whatever reason you want. You can sell it, you can uh, print it, you can uh, um, uh, do whatever you want, like basically uh, make it public domain. And uh, including also, uh, let's say, using it for a book, mm -hmm. uh, which was my main motivation actually. And um, yeah, so I just wrote a small blog post saying, hey, uh, do you want to take part and contribute some images? And surprisingly, it, uh, people started doing this. And then there was a company who reached out to me saying, we want to help you. The company is called Tagias. Um, and uh, yeah, that was like they contributed a lot of images. And oh. uh, I don't know if, if I'm most proud of this, but that was really great. Like you could see the, again, power, power of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, 
people believe in the cause and like that it's a, a good uh, good thing to do yeah. and they, they would be willing to spend their time uh, to actually collect images yeah so that was uh, quite a cool thing that's an interesting case i've never heard about crowdfunding on image resources before <laughs> very interesting one so thank you very much is there anything else you want to touch upon that we haven't talked no yes uh, maybe just join data talks club and if you yeah. have questions uh, feel free to reach out to me so data talks club is the best place for that you can also find me on twitter linkedin Cool. Yeah. And among the many resources you mentioned, we'll all link them to our show notes so the audience have easy access. And I assume if they have more questions about developing data career and they can reach out to you on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. yes, cool. Thank you so much, Alexi. I think you shed many lights on how to develop a professional data career and the many people are creating a to-do list for now, I assume. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, it was my pleasure. Data for Future, we'll see you next episode.